welcome to this special remote telecast of the Somerville Media Center's ongoing coverage of the COVID-19 pandemic. It is April 11th. I am Joe Lynch from the Somerville Media Center, and we're here with today's coverage with the State Delegation Town Hall. It is my pleasure to be joined by State Senator Pat Jalen from the 2nd Middlesex Senate District, State Representative Christine Barber from the 34th Middlesex District, State Representative Mike Conley from the 26th Middlesex District, and State Representative Denise Provo joining us by phone from the 27th Middlesex District. Good morning to all of you. First, on any of these remote broadcasts, I, and during this time, I wanna check in and see how each of you are doing. Senator Jalen, how are you and your family doing today? Well, first of all, I wanna thank you and the Somerville Media Center uh, for making this possible. I think communication is so important right now. I'm finding it important to me to talk to people uh, and have a lot of communication, so thank you. Uh, but I, my family, I'm really lucky. Uh, my husband, our daughter Wendy, and her three daughters are all living with us, and we're all getting along really well and um, spending a lot of time together, although some of it is watching Harry Potter. Glad to hear it. Representative Barber, you and yours, how you doing? Thanks, Joe. And I, I do want to thank the Somerville Media Center for this opportunity and for getting information out um, and um, continuing to kind of link us all together. Um, my family is doing okay, and I appreciate you asking. Um, and my parents, thankfully, um, are are doing okay and, and staying away from, from other people. Um, and with so many people hurting right now, um, just, just doing all I can to try to um, make sure that we're reaching out as much as possible. Representative Conley, you and yours over in Cambridge. Oh, well, thank you, Joe. Um, personally, I'm doing well. My family, uh, we're all healthy and, you know, really fortunate for that. And certainly, you know, I think our thoughts are with so many people in our community who are struggling uh, either directly as a result of the virus or as a result of the economic uh, impacts. And so thank you to you and, and to Somerville Media Center for giving us all the opportunity uh, to chat with the folks in our community this morning. Terrific. And Representative Provo, you're joining us by phone and you've been, yeah. popping, you've been popping in and out. Um, so I'm just gonna have to ask you to careful of the audio that's coming through, but how are you and your family doing here in Somerville today? Um, we are well, thank you. And thank you for having us on your show. Great. Everyone, we know what we're faced with. We know what we're in the middle of. These, this town hall is gonna give you the first opportunity to speak directly to some of your constituents via these new ways that we're gonna to have to get used to um, communicating. What we've done is to predetermine what each of you are gonna be talking about. You've each taken a topic. Um, we're gonna to start off with Senator Jalen. Senator Jalen has some things she wants to talk about for the unemployment insurance and for the small business support that is now ongoing and maybe some stuff to come. Senator Jalen, why don't you take it away? So I'm very happy to tell you that 200,000 people in Massachusetts yesterday saw uh, $1,200 or 600 uh, in their bank accounts uh, because of the federal action in the CARES Act. So that was a, a good start. We, my focus as chair of uh, labor and workforce development has been on unemployment and small business opportunities to keep the economy going. So we wanted to make sure that the benefits were extended from 26 weeks to 30. That was the first thing the Senate did. Um, but most of the relief has come from the federal government because they have the resources and the ability to, bar, uh, uh, to go into debt, which we don't uh, at the same level. So in the CARES Act, they extended benefits for 13 more weeks for people. Uh, they gave $600 additional for four months for people on unemployment. And they um, uh, made it possible for people in the gig economy or self-employed people uh, to get unemployment benefits. But that last one hasn't kicked in yet because it requires an update in the systems, the IT for the Labor Department. So that will not start until probably April 30th. That's a big disappointment. Um, second, for small business, the CARES Act did a lot of things in terms of loans 
Many of them, for, or at least two of them, are forgivable loans for small businesses. Particularly the most popular one, and the one that we've had the most trouble with, is the uh, PPP, uh, which would allow the Payroll Protection, Paycheck Protection Act, which will allow small businesses to keep people on the payroll, give them forgivable loans, uh, which will be really important. So all of those are very important. Uh, I can't give all the details right now, but I hope people will either look at the state website or at our website, um, subscribe. All of us have newsletters that give people information. I've been focusing on um, unemployment and uh, small business opportunities. Great. And another thing I have to say is that uh, one thing the state legislature did do is to allow restaurants to deliver wine and beer uh, if they already have it in inventory. And that, I think, is going to be help them a lot um, stay alive. Small businesses and restaurants always have a hard time. Uh, and in this situation, it's really desperate. But um, hope you order a lot of takeout if you can afford it. Well, you know that's going to be happening at this house. Takeout for food and wine and beer. Senator Jalen, <laughs> thank you. I have a question, though, very quick. Uh, some of the systems are, are not cooperating with folks who are trying to enter their information. Do we have any more update from the state level as to whether or not the state system is going to be able to handle the volume of applications coming in for unemployment and for small business support? Absolutely. We spoke to the secretary yesterday and uh, they have, first of all, the number of applications for unemployment has increased by more than 20 times. In response, they have increased the number of people in the call center, the virtual call center, um, by from 50 to almost 600 in two weeks. That's incredible. They're working really hard. On, at the same time, as you point out, there are more people calling our office about the inability to access those um, than any other problem right now. So one thing that I, one tip I would offer is that if you uh, ask for a call back and you don't think you've gotten one, it may be because you got a call from an unidentified number. The number, the callbacks from the state will be from an unidentified number. Got so it. If you're waiting for a call, pick up the phone. Okay. Um, Representative Barbara, we're talking about a lot these days about healthcare support. People, be, people are still trying to get tested. People are trying to worry, they're worried about how their healthcare is gonna be covered. Do you wanna take that part of it? Take it away. Sure, thanks Joe, again, for getting all this information out and for having us today. Um, and as a longtime healthcare advocate, I've really been focused on making sh pe sure people get the care that they need. Um, so the number one thing that people should know is that the testing and the treatment for COVID-19 is covered. So no matter what, um, so no matter your immigration status, um, this COVID-19 is not being counted for public charge, which is something that a lot of um, immigrants are really concerned about these days. Um, no matter if you're uninsured right now, um, the COVID-19 testing and treatment will be covered. So there's lots of options for people to sign up for care. Um, the state announced an open enrollment period, so you can go on the Connector website um, and sign up through May 25th. So if you, you don't have insurance, um, if you just lost your job, there's a lot of affordable options on there too. So um, even if you, you have some income from unemployment, it's really likely that you'll be eligible for some help with your health insurance. So I really encourage people go on the website if possible. There's also a 1-800 number for the connector or for Mass Health, um, and they'll both lead you to healthcare coverage. So really encouraging people if, if you, your income has changed to call and to try to see what options are available to you. Um, we've also been looking a lot at, at help for, um, for immigrants and um, especially immigrants who um, some may not qualify for some of the unemployment programs Senator Jalen was just talking about. Um, for undocumented folks who don't have a work authorization, that's a big challenge. And right now there's some funds that are being set up um, and I'm, I'm hearing of a local one that's, that's being set up soon, but there's also the Undocu Fund um, that people can donate to that helps people who may not be eligible for um, traditional unemployment. 
Okay. One question that I asked you on a previous appearance last week was about the hospitals in our district. So for instance, Somerville Hospital, the old Somerville Hospital is now belongs to the Cambridge Health Alliance. Their emergency room is still open. Do we have any update on whether or not they plan to use the Somerville Hospital as an overflow? And likewise, Cambridge has Cambridge City Hospital, Mount Auburn, um, Winchester has the Winchester Hospital, um, Medford, you had talked about, you know, the two hospitals that Medford once had, which is now part of Melrose Wakefield. Do you want to talk about those local hospitals and how prepared they are for this coming week or two weeks out? Yeah, definitely. I've been talking with leadership at uh, Cambridge Health Alliance, which runs the Somerville Hospital, and at Melrose Wakefield, which is runs what was Lawrence Memorial in Medford. Um, I talk to them very frequently. Um, they're both doing incredible jobs um, getting set up and trying to use really every available space um, and even outfit, you know, waiting rooms and other things that weren't typically um, uh, inpatient rooms for the coming surge. Um, at, at CHA, they're incredible at serving people with different language access um, issues and, and people who may not be, may be uninsured. They're an incredible safety net resource. Um, and they're really, they're seeing a lot of patients but have been up to the task. So um, I really, I, I think they're doing an amazing job and getting ready to do all that they can. Great. I'm gonna segue right into Representative Conley. He's gonna be talking about housing and eviction moratoriums. But Representative Conley, what have you got for the district in terms of the readiness of Mount Auburn Hospital and Cambridge City Hospital? Uh, you know, what I'm hearing is that our local hospitals are really working around the clock, doing everything they can. Um, but like all of our medical facilities, I think there's challenges, you know, to meet this surge that's coming. Um, so certainly um, impressed with the effort and you know, I think the challengers, uh, you know, speak to the need for everyone to stay home as much as possible. So hopefully we can minimize how many people uh, get sick from this terrible virus. So on the housing and the eviction, I know you've been working on that in the state house at the state house level. Do you want to update us on that? Absolutely. Um, you know, we're now in a place where both the House and the Senate have passed very strong uh, eviction and foreclosure moratorium legislation, which is so important. You know, we keep hearing the messages, stay home. Uh, and obviously that means uh, we, we can't see people being put out into the street or people um, afraid that if they can't get the money to make their rent, they're gonna have to go out to work when they're sick. You know, either of those possibilities would totally defeat uh, the public health objective of staying home. Uh, and really the idea for the eviction moratorium came directly from uh, folks who are most impacted on the front lines. Uh, City Life Vita Urbana uh, is one of the great housing justice organizations that we all work with. Uh, they had organized a demonstration uh, within hours of Governor Baker declaring a state of emergency one month ago yesterday. Uh, and they were calling for this eviction moratorium uh, and so I uh, worked with housing chair Kevin Honan to draft legislation. Our entire Somerville delegation uh, co-sponsored the legislation along with over 70 other legislators. Uh, and so for the past few weeks, there's been an intensive focus uh, in advancing this legislation to ensure that people can stay in their homes. Uh, one of the most, I think, uh, beautiful aspects of how this bill came together is it really addresses a whole range of concerns. So it's an eviction moratorium. It's a foreclosure moratorium. Uh, it also will prevent evictions for small businesses in our community, and we know they're struggling. Um, and, you know, as I, as I mentioned, both the House and the Senate have passed strong bills. So I think over the next few days, there'll be an effort to reconcile those bills. But just to quickly highlight uh, some of the key points on, on both sides, on both bills, uh, both bills have an eviction uh, and foreclosure moratorium. Both bills say that landlords cannot charge late fees or send negative reports to credit agencies um, if a tenant is falling behind as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic or emergency. Uh, both bills prohibit uh, action on, on every range of the eviction process from notices to quit 
uh, to summary process cases and then to executions, which is sort of the final step of an eviction process. Um, the bill uh, also allows for video conferencing on reverse mortgages, um, something we heard from folks was very important. So certainly I think it's um, you know a first step and we know there will be an, a need to do additional steps. You know, step one is keep people in their home. And then step two, I think we have to take action to address the fact that some people will through no fault of their own be falling behind on their rent and so we're also going to have to um, take action to ensure that those folks are made whole and that they're protected uh, in this unprecedented situation. So, Representative Conley, let me let me try to filter that down. The protections that are out there for both residential and commercial, uh, what you're trying to do is protect them during the pandemic. How long are those protections in play? Are they until the emergency declaration is lifted or do they last beyond that? That's one of the final details that we're just ironing out right now. The House bill um, would keep them in play for the entire emergency and, and an additional 30 days. I believe the Senate um, said it would be 120 days and then it could be extended from there. So, um, so more to come on that. More to come, but certainly I think the intent on both sides is to put these uh, very necessary protections in place as soon Great. as possible. Okay. Thank you very much, Mike. We're gonna move on to Representative Provost. Representative, you've been patient on the phone. Thank you so much. You're gonna be talking a little bit about the education and the uh, some other additional things that you wanna talk about. Take it away, Denise Provost. Thank you. Thank you very much, Joe. Um, you know, there have been a lot of emails and calls recently about the need to suspend the MCAS requirement this year and Massachusetts did apply to the federal government to do so. Um, standardized testing is required under, if you remember it, that federal No Child Left Behind Act from a decade or so back. We got the waiver and yesterday signed, the Gov Governor Baker signed a bill that um, suspends the MCAS requirement for this year. So that is on April 10th, that bill went into effect. Um, the governor signed it yesterday, yes. Yes. Excellent news, I think, for a lot of the parents out there and the students themselves. Yes, and, and for teachers, who's, especially those whose students are living in homes where they might not have internet access or uh, a computer or it's very crowded and noisy. Um, you know, some Somerville residents teach in places like East Boston and Chelsea, other communities where their students are having a hard time studying from remote and How keeping on, up with. On the education side, Representative Provost, I, I, I think I have this right that the Somerville School District will be sticking with its um, spring break vacation. Is that a correct statement? Uh, yeah, I, it is. Yes. okay, we that was yes. better than I. Yeah, yeah, and I know that some school districts are sticking with a curriculum during the spring vacation. So that, that has a lot of play on how these kids are gonna be learning going forward. Do we have any other updates on the education side of things, such as, <clears throat> excuse me, maybe anecdotal, about whether or not the school systems are going back to physical school or are they gonna be out for the rest of the year? Well, in this last week, the governor has admitted that it's not realistic that the schools will go back into session on May 4th, which was the most recent extension of, of closure that he'd made. There has not been a specific date set. And then on the update on education, um, do you have any do you have any sense from I, I know you have a wide range of educators that you talk to. Do you have any sense of how well the kids are adapting to remote learning? Oh, it varies considerably. It varies considerably. I think it it's doing a little better with higher education. I'm on the higher education committee and we've been meeting by teleconference. Um, and of, of course, all 
pretty all the universities and colleges in the state have moved to remote learning. They were ahead of the curve with that. But there's a lot of concern about whether uh, at least the state system of higher education will be able to open up again in the fall. So uh, once again, you know, here we are going into the middle of April and there is still an ever changing environment out there, whether it's health or it's housing or it's education. But all of you, you know, we promised you from the Somerville Media Center that we're going to give you the opportunity every week to do these types of info sessions for your constituents, um, whether it's to be uh, chatting amongst yourselves or specifically addressing one specific need. We do have some questions though that came in. Thank you, Representative Provo. We have some questions that came in from the outside and I'm gonna to try to direct these as best I can. So we have a question from Laura and Laura asked if tests will be made available to home health providers. I'm gonna give that one to Representative Barber. Um, it's a good question and um, I would say the ants, I don't, it's not a clear answer. So in some cases there are tests to home health providers. One of the things we've really been pushing for is PPE, which is the personal protective equipment that um, many have been talking about. But especially for people who are going into homes, um, you know, it's not just for health providers, it's for social workers, um, early intervention specialists, and people who are doing home health work um, with seniors and um, people with disabilities. So okay. it's been an ongoing struggle and something that we're continuing to work on and we know needs more work. So we'll Thanks, keep that. Christi Thanks, Christine. We have another question that's coming in from... Um... Oh, let me just add something there, Joe. Sure that the places we're most concerned about are places in congregate living, uh, nursing homes and assisted livings where 40% of the deaths have occurred. Certainly not 40% of people live in those uh, places, but there's so much opportunity for contagion, both among the residents and among the workers. There is already a worker shortage across the spectrum of senior services in home health and in, um, and in uh, nursing facilities. So it's really been a problem that, first of all, home um, people, home care clients have been turning down visits because they're afraid. Uh, and home care workers are uh, coming in, calling in sick. Uh, it's been a very big challenge for the home care agencies as well as and I think it's going to continue to be, Senator Jalen, and, and it's a good segue into the next question that's coming from Bridget. I'm going to give this one to Representative Conley. Uh, Bridget wants to know, um, will the Department, uh, Massachusetts Department of Corrections publish the infection stats for folks who are in prison, in jail, in detention? I haven't seen any of those being published. You got any update on that, Representative Conley? Uh, well, our delegation working with Senator Jalen, uh, as a matter of fact, uh, we, our staff was able to obtain some numbers, so credit to Senator Jalen for this. Um, but Prisoners Legal Services has calculated that 46 prisoners out of 7,841 across the state have contracted the illness. Um, so that's a rate of 0.59% which is about 2.5 times higher uh, than the statewide uh, rate that we're aware of. Um, and the group Prisoner Legal Services, one of the really best advocacy groups that we all work with, um, they also point out that they're estimating that the uh, rate for the Department of Correction employees is 0.33%, uh, which is also significantly higher. And you know, uh, thank you, you know, um, to uh, Bridget who raised this question and thank you, Joe, for bringing it up because it really speaks to uh, three categories um, of, of groups that, that I'm thinking of and I know we're all thinking of that are too often forgotten. And that is, you know, people who are incarcerated, people who are experiencing homelessness and uh, people who are undocumented immigrants. And, you know, those are groups that uh, it's always been a struggle to get justice and recognition for their needs in state government. And now I think these struggles are becoming uh, immediate emergencies. And so it's, it's so important that we address this and we really need to decarcerate as much as we can and to get folks uh, out of um, 
these these congregate situations like prison um where they you know you, it shouldn't it shouldn't be a death sentence um if you were you know sent to prison but because of covid-19 uh it it very well could be a death sentence and that's just totally wrong uh, you know i think uh, senator jalen raises the issue of you know our seniors many of which live in congregate housing our veterans some of the veterans are living in congregate congregate housing um, our prisoners or are very close together. So th I think what happens now is that this pandemic has exposed the underbelly of how we do a lot of things in this country. It's going to take us a long time to dig out from underneath that. Um, but I want to kind of stay today um, with what's happening in your district. Um, I know that people are starting to get very nervous about the numbers. They're starting to see the numbers climb very, very quickly from uh, housing or healthcare workers. I know in Somerville, um, there was a Somerville and Medford, uh, Tufts University is offering some of their student housing for overflow. How about in Cambridge? Do we have anything in Cambridge that's being done for um, some type of housing for our healthcare workers during the pandemic? Uh, it's a great question. So Harvard and MIT have made uh, some of their dorm rooms available for first responders. Uh, in particular, the city of Cambridge has set up a uh, an overflow shelter uh, for people who are unhoused at the War Memorial um, Gymnasium. And so certainly, you know, uh, those are some of the efforts that are being made. And, and just to add a point about the numbers, you know, when you think about it, it's just absolutely terrifying. Uh, the weekend after Governor Baker announced the state of emergency, we were at around 190 cases in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, confirmed or presumed. And uh, we were saying at the time, we sent a letter to the governor, the entire Somerville delegation signed on, calling on him to do the stay at home order and to shut down non-essential businesses. And we warned in that letter that there could be 10,000 cases by the end of March. And we actually crossed over that 10,000 number uh, last week, at the end of last week, uh, around April 3rd, and just yesterday, we crossed over into 20,000 confirmed cases. Yeah, so these of, are, I'm sorry, Representative, as of this morning, we have 21,000 confirmed cases with 600 dead. So this thing is on track to get worse in the coming days. Um, correct, I just, yeah, and so stay at home if, you, if at all possible for everyone. I just, you know, I want to try to wrap this up very quickly. So I want to thank all the guests, Senator Jalen, Representative Conley, Representative Barber, Representative Provo. This is not the last time we're going to do this. Um, we will do whatever you guys need us to do to facilitate these types of town halls. So I want to thank you all very much doing the people's work. Um, for Somerville Media Center, I'm Joe Lynch. Thank you for watching. See you next time.